Hey there, welcome to Broadcast to Post. I'm Jeff Sengfield, CTO at Keycode Media. This is the show where we interview leaders and experts in the AV, broadcast, and post-production spaces. We're giving you the inside tips to grow your media workflows and business today. So when it comes to collaborating on content for television, film, or the internet, there's so much information available about how to write better, how to shoot better, and how to edit better. However, just as you see a massive chunk of mass below the surface of an iceberg, data management is one of the most important parts of operating a smooth production and post-production process. It happens below the surface. Today, we're joined by enterprise sales executive Todd Arnold and vice president of Spectrologic, Hossein Zia Shakwari. For the past 43 years, Spectrologic has been helping develop products specific to supporting media companies archive reliably and responsibly. Welcome, Hossein and Todd. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us here today. All right, let's get into our questions. Number one, basics. Why do we archive? So first of all, how does archive for media differ from traditional IT? In traditional IT, usually when they archive something, it's something that they, they basically create a copy of it on some sort of medium and they put it away. They, they hardly have a need for it. In the media market, the what they archive, if you go by the traditional sense and how things used to be, yeah, you, you create a copy of it on, on some sort of medium and you hardly ever used it. But things have changed these days. In, you know, nowadays, there are so many different ways that the that content gets used. And, and you know, with the new streaming platform and the new markets and new ways of monetizing uh, the assets and all that. B basically, as we, we all know, basically asset equates money. And so being able to, when we talk about archiving in, in media market, you nowadays create uh, a repository of all your assets that has to provide continuous and reliable access to them all the time. So that, that's how it differs. I, I don't even know that the term archive in today's market really makes sense is because, because it's such an active part of, of uh, using that content for business purposes and with, you know, it all being monetization and stuff like that. It's, it's part of this life cycle of that content. It didn't end where it used to end. It continues to go on. But then right. archive is different from the other three concepts in, in dealing with data for backup business continuity and disaster recovery. So how are those, how are those in relation to relationship to archive? When you talk about disaster recovery, you, you're thinking about something drastic happens and you need to be able to recover all your assets. But when we're talking about business continuity, you cannot have any gap in the operation of the business because that, as we said again, that equates to, to dollar amounts. Therefore, when you're talking about business continuity, you wanna make sure that all the assets are accessible to you and available to you all the time. And that business continuity, it, it also means something in a way of being able to run the business around the clock because a lot of, you know, nowadays in our businesses, we operate across different sites and business units and partners and stuff like that. So you want to have that continuous operation on your content all the time. So, so things, you know, definitions are really changing. They're very dynamic these days, how, how we run things and how we do things. Very cool. So let's get into the to the different mediums that are used for this type of data. Um, what are the pros and the cons of each? We've got tape, we've got near line on disk, and we've got cloud. When we're talking about archive and data management, if, if we're in a conversation to that level of things, you know, we, we've saw the wrong, we've got to talk about it at a much higher level. Relative, it's really all about the business need, it's all about the workflow, it's all about the processes that you have in place, and it's all about the, the nature of the business and what have you. So when you're looking at that, you know, you're looking at those stuff, the, the, the those storage medium, what you're looking at, you should be looking at this, the, the workflows and your processes and all that. And what you want to do, you want to look at the performance of the system, the relative access to the content versus the cost. And you want to look at throughout the stages of, of the basic workflow. So you want to look at 
different storage medium for different part of the workflow as you manage the data, all of them offer value. You know, when you look at basically tape, there are a lot of benefits to that. You know, you can, you can look at it from cost perspective, that is that's the number one reason that quite often people look at. But if you look at it nowadays, tape can also mean, you know, creating air gap to create against cyber attack, to create against other threats or someone basically being able to have easy access to content movement. If you're looking at near line storage, then you can look at basically, you can look at high performance NAS, you can look at object storage. Each of those provide different value. In case of uh, near line that, you know, and being basically a NAS, applications can have easier access to it, but it's not necessarily as scalable and as easily as manageable as object storage, which is kind of scale quite widely and all that. And then you look at cloud as a medium. If you look at cloud as a medium, there are some values associated with that. It could be for DR, it could be for maybe different workflows. So when you look at it in terms of storage medium to hold a religious conversation, I don't know that that makes sense. It's better to look at it from the business perspective and from workflow perspective, and then we can design, you know, partners such as yourself, where you have a lot of capabilities and technical com competencies and all that, to look at the business need, to look at the need of the whole business, and then design something, and we will work with you and all that, to define what is the best storage medium for what purpose. And, and I think, as you mentioned before, being able to monetize that content, how often you're going to be able to be pulling certain types of content back, that's, that's good kind of inform the the medium which also then informs the tier of what people know as the ar archive tiers and what the applications are for each so yes. active archive inactive archive and then deep archive that's right active if, if you look at archive again when we look at it, it nowadays you know active archive is all about accessibility is that almost nowadays, I would say that all content has to be available all the time, regardless of where the user is. That that's, is really the nature of business these days. When you look at when you're looking at act, uh, inactive archiving or deep archiving, that just means different thing. That just means long term retention. That means disaster recovery. That means uh, protection against maybe cyber attack. That sort of stuff. So I would I would argue that that almost we should separate those definitions you know, quite, quite differently. These are terms that we've used in the past based on the practices of the past, but nowadays, you know, does the term archive mean something really? Maybe a large asset repository is a better definition for that. And then uh, for long-term retention, deep archive would be a better definition. Yeah. And, and, and Jeff, you know, go back to your original question, the difference between media and traditional IT is really that content that we're storing, right? In traditional IT, it's just a bunch of files that if we lose them, it could be traumatic, but it's not what you use to generate income for your business, right? So in the media and entertainment side of things, we call them assets for a reason, right? They're worth money. And with, if they're not available, if they're not accessible, even in a deep archive, they still need to be accessible or you're not going to be able to monetize that content over, over years, right? So it, that, that becomes the important part of the difference between the media uh, and traditional IT. And, and I think one of the archives also that exists out there is an archive for regulatory compliance. Because yes, I've right. had that where, hey, we've got to have an archive of everything we shot this season to say that we've got the archive of everything we shot this season. It's the stuff that everybody used to send off for the salt mines from the networks. Right. And, and we do have a lot of our customers, especially a lot of studios, a lot of content creators and all that. It is, after all, is is the gold mine. And and deep archiving, it also means that. And, and to be able to put those and have that degree of protection, that that's... That means something big. Awesome. So getting into the migrations to cloud, why are customers doing it? Now, that's what, what, a, what a great question. What, what a relevant question nowadays, right? Um, you know, if, if one thing that I would hail basically all the cloud providers when the, their marketing team is really how great they, they told the story of the cloud, right? Uh, I mean, who wouldn't like easy, who wouldn't like basically agility, who wouldn't like the, the ability to, to scale when you want to and, and to, you know, as in terms of low cost. And, all, and there are values to that, right? 
there are a lot of value in the cloud that, you know, they're in terms of uh, maybe distribution or the services that they offer. Uh, there are a variety of services that are offered in the cloud. You know, some of the cloud guys, I myself, you know, completely agree is that considering the strength of cloud providers, you know, things like AI, you know, facial recognitions or, or you know, AI stuff like that are of great value people want to take advantage of. But you also got to look at it as the devil is in the details is, is once you get into the subtleties and nuances and stuff like that, or things that that matters a lot, but but when you look at as you know to go to go back to your question as to why people are moving to cloud, is because they have they are looking into a lot of these services and all that that could be of value uh, to them. Some of them uh, there are often reasons that people want to scale, as is the cases you know in the post annual production projects come and go, and sometimes you just need to immediately scale. That's a reason to do that. Maybe you want to look at it from a complete disaster recovery. That's a reason. Maybe you want to take advantage of certain certain cloud services. Those are reasons. But and and we do have a lot of customers and we have a lot of tools to help m migrate folks to the cloud. But then again, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it more is the devil is in the detail and the subtleties and nuances to deal with that. And that's where you guys, you know, partners like you come into picture quite a bit. Exactly. So what would you say some of the pain points are, the issues that happen, that, and getting around those to have a strategy for success when it comes to cloud migrations? Quite often we see and we hear folks that they say, I just got to go to the cloud. Well, what does that mean? Is, is it just your data? Is it a particular application that you're moving in there? Is it is it is it uh, that you want to share content? Is it that you want to collaborate? It, what is it? And and quite often people jump into that and they really don't understand the applications that were designed maybe for on-prem that may not necessarily run in the cloud well, or maybe if they put content in the cloud, what are the cost implications of that? Or if they put content in the cloud and they want to collaborate, how do you orchestrate the content to be at the right place for the right application in proximity to the place where, where the content is needed? How do you orchestrate? Quite often, we find a lot of challenges associated with those. Um, with the other things that we see quite regularly is, well, how do you take your content out of, you know, we've been talking about archive. How do you take that content out of these storage mediums, the spread of the storage mediums, or you know, managed by different applications and put them in the cloud in a way that are accessible by other applications that may have to access them in the, in the cloud. So a lot of folks do not understand the, those nuances or they don't have the technology or the technical process to, to figure out how to do it. And that's the role that you, and that's the role that us, that you know, we, we got to play in to help them educate on how to get to that and how to take advantage of some of those services that are actually of value. Well, I, I think it's, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, the, the people, they look at the advantages of saying, well, we can go completely from a CapEx model to an OpEx model and eliminate a lot of bare metal. I don't have to hire a bunch of IT guys to manage my infrastructure locally anymore. Uh, and they and they take a giant leap to get into that, right? And they and they they find out later, you know, if they don't have the conversation with with people with experience in moving to a cloud, say such as the key code media engineers and in, in 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 our team, they they make a big leap and then realize, wow, this isn't the nirvana that we thought it was going to be, right? And then, and that's the, again, and to back to Hossein's point, we're not anti-cloud. I think there's a tremendous value for everybody out there to have some sort of cloud presence, some kind of leveraging of all of those resources that the cloud provides. But you, ha there still has to be some sort of on-prem type of infrastructure to be able to to really use that cloud efficiently and effectively. And also understanding that if you're going to burn the boats, that you need to have enough space to store the load that was in the boats. Very well put. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, yes, the cloud guys are beginning to create you know, more and more comprehensive solution. But we're also seeing a lot of the newcomers that are creating new and creative services and all that. And the other thing that we're seeing is that a lot of companies who have done some elements of cloud integration or completely moved to cloud, 
we see them that they, they're talking about multi-cloud. The reason for that is, is, is again, it is, it, it is a business continuity decision. It's a business security decision as well, too. So if you want to have that degree of freedom, then how do you deal with that? Do you create enough abstraction of, of your, your medium so that you can easily move from cloud to cloud without incurring the, the, the probably tremendous amount of egress associated with that? So you got to really understand what services in the cloud you want to take advantage of and what sort of implication potentially that can have to your business and what are the gotchas that you got to oversee. And... And that's where you guys come in. That's where, you know, the, the folks who come and understand the whole workflow and look at these potential gotchas along the way and design a solution that can take advantage of the cloud value at the same time relative to the business and what might be a combination of multiple sites and multiple cloud and multiple application and all that. So, so I would just encourage, you know, those who are looking at it is just looking at all all details it, again it, it's just those nuances that matters most definitely and, and you mentioned multi-site we've been getting a lot of requests for multi-site syncing of storage yeah. um what what are you seeing in in that world multi-site syncing of storage maybe maybe syncing maybe if we take the the word syncing out, out of that and just talk about multi-site and why you know, the, the talk of multi-site, because, you know, as you know, a lot of the business entities, they operate across, you know, they have different offices across different localities. Uh, there are the, the creative groups or workforce are distributed in different places, in different continents and all that. Uh, quite often they operate and they want to be able to operate around the clock to, you know, around, you know, follow the sun. The, it could also be, collaboration, it could be content sharing among them, or it could be business continuity. And one side fails and you know all these are all expensive resources to be able to do that. So from that perspective, it's more about collaboration, content sharing, business security, business continuity and all that. Then we, you know, if we then look at the word syncing, then then you look at the workflow, right? At what stages of the workflow or content processing does the term syncing apply? Is it during editorial and you are synchronizing, you know, a, a file, an active file between different sites that different people are working on continuously? Or is it about the threshold for pain? Should something happen to production and storage that you know that you can minimize the losses within a window of time? You know, we see that quite a bit. Or is it about replicating content and making sure that the content is available to the user at different localities? So proximity of content to, to the people. So from that perspective, we we actually see that quite a bit uh, where people look at multi-site and further above that multi-cloud, how do they run their business and their operations across such platform? And in order typically to do that, you know, we have a lot of tools, we, you know, we've talked with you guys and you're aware of it and, and there are other tools, but to be able to abstract the storage layer and decouple that from the applications and site and storage medium is ultimately the solution to make sure that you can operate from different sites at different time and based on different application. That abstraction, I, I argue that is probably a very central and important aspect of it, whether it is to be able to access content from different sites or whether it is to give you, create abstraction across cloud buckets so that you have that degree of freedom. To me and to us from a spectrologic perspective, Helping create that abstraction is a huge part of where we're focusing on and what, what we're doing. Sorry, a long, a long answer to, to your question, but please continue. No, no, that's that's great. Um, I mean, it, it sounds like in the whole getting into an archive strategy or a, a, a data strategy, the the first thing you got to find out is what is the business requirement or what is the customer requirement to your business. Sometimes you don't own the content you're having to um, archive or backup or uh, offer DR on. Um, right. A lot of large customers have 
requirements that are already outlined. It's just simple. Hey, here's what here's what it is we need to do, um, and then figuring out the the medium that fits into the archive tier strategy right. and the, to meet the business objectives. So what are you seeing where where these different things make sense? A, a tape to tape concept, a tape to disc concept, uh, disc to cloud or tape to cloud. But what I think it was Bill Gates who said that, you know, that that content is king, right? Well, it's king so long as you can access it, so long as you can monetize it. So long as you can you can push it out to a broader market and all that. So if you look at it from that perspective, uh-huh. then tape to tape or tape to disc and all that, I would I would I would raise it that you start looking at the whole thing or look at archiving and data management. It shouldn't be an afterthought. It should be at the forefront of every project, every workflow, every content processing that you look at. Is that you know, like you said, you you look at the business need and and you look at how you want to achieve that, and then based on that, you design a solution. And any of those that you name can be part of it. But as you very well know, you know, archiving and and availability should be something that is considered from ingest all the way to distribution and or play out if you know if that happened to be in broadcast or what have you but you may want to consider those those stages and what to do with your content where you place them and how do you clean them those should be part of it another thing that we're seeing uh, if i may elaborate on that is we are trying to put more and more intelligence into that whole process but also what you do with it and and what to do with what asset you know, we've, we, we've always been used to keeping every copy of everything and every version all the time. But nowadays, more and more cost matters more. Uh, scaling, you know, now we create so much content that you got to be able to have more control over it. And you want to keep track of also the value of assets throughout the stages of the workflow. So, so adding more and more tools that does asset tracking, therefore deciding what assets should be, where and how many copies, all of that matters more. And those are areas that we're putting a lot of focus on to do asset value tracking, cost tracking relative to access number of times that is used. So, so I would look at it again, uh, there's no single answer, but it's really more about looking at every business need and design a workflow and all of that you know, put that into the formula to, to do what you, what makes most sense for that. Definitely. I mean, content is king, but if the king, if, if the monarchy is in exile, that's right. There's not much you can do with that. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it goes back to, you know, the, 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 the strategy is the question, right? And, and too often we see that let's just build a gigantic tier one and that, and then my, that's my strategy. And when it gets filled, we're just going to add more disc to my tier one. And, that's not a strategy. That's just digging yourself and talking about, you know, calling that CFO and telling them I need to put another 500 terabytes in my tier one. They fall and out of their chair. We're always happy to hear that, but it's, <laughs> it's the most sensible way to, it's, to have your business run. It's not a strategy, right? It's just yeah. not a strategy. And you've got to figure out ways to tier that data and make it make it so it doesn't affect your workflow, but also doesn't cause you to go bankrupt at the end because you're not making proper use of your tiering and the ability to access that content that is king. Yeah. And and I think the real message here is, you know, help us help you monetize your content and discover what your assets can do for you going forward and figure out the best data management strategy, um, you know, with with Spectra and, and Kiko to get something cohesive in place and get that executed and and tested. That's the yep. other thing. Yeah, utilize uh, the professionals that know what they're talking about, that have done this over and over and over again and have proven that they know how to put together all of those proper resources, whether it's the hardware, whether it's the consultative approach to putting together different uh, resources that Spectra can bring in, that other uh, resources that Kiko gathers around and, and and get a strategy from day one on an entire archive solution. 
and the archive starts with that tier one. So, you know, I don't I don't consider archive starting at tier two and moving back. I consider the archive starting at tier one and it's a complete package from ingest to distribution and to DR cloud or what whatever that long term uh, resiliency looks like. The, the, the one, if, if I may just add one last quick note to that is also, uh, and more and more we see that and we're having those conversations also is, what what is the customer's vision for their business three or five or 10 years down the road as well too? Because architecturally you wanna, you know, we wanna design something collectively that that basically extends itself well into, after all, we are, you know, it's a very dynamic market. Things are changing quite a bit. So that flexibility and that extensibility into, into the future and how things change also matters quite a bit. Because, you know, there's there's quite a benefit that you can gain from that. And, and that comes only way that comes out. It's just you guys are a lot closer to those customers and all that. You can help them understand those, those uh, business requirements, those uh, process requirements and all that. And then to be able to know all of that and then design something that makes a huge difference. Definitely. I mean, 300 bucks for a 10 by 10 at public storage, it's not a strategy either. <laughs> no, it doesn't so, look that way. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for joining me today. Um, glad to have you here and talking about... Uh, strategies and and ways to make data work for people's businesses absolutely thank you very much i appreciate the opportunity it's great seeing you guys and talking with you guys yeah thank you for having us thanks for watching broadcast to post please make sure to subscribe to the podcast to receive future episodes follow key code media on linkedin twitter facebook or instagram to receive news on additional av broadcast and post-production technology content see you next time folks